I'll be the first to admit that I have not done a whole lot of AIO water cooling loop reviews on this channel. That's probably because I'm a bit of a water cooling snob who's all caught up in his own little world thinking everyone should have a fully custom loop. We'll just go ahead and put aside Naive J for a little bit here and we'll bring it back down to earth because I know not everyone's comfortable with doing a complete custom loop. That is why AIOs exist in the first place. They're inexpensive, they're easy to install, and they're maintenance free. Well, at CES, EVGA showed off some of their new water cooling products. Yeah, the company has been making graphics cards, power supplies, and motherboards is now making water cooling loops. They've been making cases. Eventually, you'll be able to have an entirely EVGA built system. Now, EVGA sent me over two of their closed loop CPU coolers. That's what they're actually called. It even says so in the box, closed loop CPU cooler. And UPS wasn't very kind to this one. But I've got the 120 right here and the 280 sitting on the test bench. So let's go ahead and take a look at how well their first implementation of an AIO actually went. So what do you think? You know, I'll be honest. I'm uh, kind of impressed by its proportions. I know, right? All right, but let me show you something here. Ugh. I kind of like the thin ones. Mm, but this one is about form factor. Yeah, but mine can fit in tight spaces. With girth, you can open tight spaces. It's like a master key. Whether you like thick or thin, the ITX lineup from Fractal Design is sure to have something that tickles your fancy. Remember, it's not the size that matters. It's all about how you use it. No, it's definitely the girth. No thinness. Girth, dude. Thinness. Girth. There's no contest. No, there's contest. It's girth. I immediately unboxed the 280 and stuck it on my X99 system with the 5930K that's currently overclocked to 4.3 gigahertz. And then I kind of put the 120 aside. We'll talk about this one. But yeah, I feel, we're gonna see how good the packaging is. Cause like I said, UPS was not very kind to this one. So I've not actually opened this one up yet. It could be a leaky mess in there. I doubt it, we'll see. But uh, anyway, yeah, the 280's on the system and that's the one I actually benchmarked. I didn't really feel that putting a 120 on an overclock 5930K with six cores and 12 threads with hyper threading was, was very fair. But this is a perfect cooler for something like an i3 or an i5 uh, with a mild to moderate overclock. Now EVGA did partner with Asa Tech for this. So the radiator is gonna be pretty familiar. It's actually a high FPI radiator. It's gonna give you pretty good uh, heat capacity for a smaller size. Now the 120, I'd be pretty comfortable with putting this on something like an i3, an i5, or even an i7, if you didn't put a high overclock on that. Uh, keep your AMD sockets pretty cool, especially things like Athlons and uh, FM socket CPUs. I have no doubt that this would have a pretty good job at cooling most CPUs. I just did not feel like it was very fair to put this cooler on my 5930K, which is overclocked. We're gonna go ahead and let the big brother take care of that one. Uh, but I will be using this probably in a future small form factor build because this is, this is just worth using. One of the things I really hate about a lot of the all-in-one coolers that are on the market is everyone uses that god awful, ugly FEP tubing. You know what I'm talking about, the one that looks like it's ribbed for her pleasure. Yeah, I, don't, I hate that stuff. It's stiff when you when you twist it, it tends to wanna, I'm popping the cover off here, I don't wanna hurt the thermal compound. But when you twist it, it tends to kinda wanna go its own way. EVGA uses a paracord sleeved rubber tubing. It's the same tubing that they use on their hybrid coolers, starting back with the GTX 980 hybrid that they launched. It's extremely flexible. And you can see that I can practically knot this thing if I want it, and it doesn't kink, it's so, friendly when it comes to installing. If you guys have ever dealt with an AIO and FEP tubing, you know that once you start to twist it, I just hit myself in the face with the cables. But you can see here with the rubber tubing, I can practically knot this thing and it still won't kink. Look at that. It just wants to straighten itself back out before it kinks. It's so amazing. I love that. I'm not gonna pull on it too hard though. I don't wanna, I don't wanna pop the damn thing out. That would actually probably make this an epic video if that happened. Anyway, then moving on. Uh, I'm not convinced about this fan. We're gonna do another video in the future about these fans. It's a, it's a very radical design where they basically took the sides of the fan shroud here and cut it out. I don't know if they're trying to pick up air from the sides of the fan or if they're trying to create a more directional airflow without it being a normal like conical shape. I really have no idea. Now when the fans are running, I could feel a bit of backsplash, but the temperatures don't really seem to show that there's any sort of issue when it comes to that. So what I'm curious about is if later on I do another test where I put another fan on here and see if it actually improves temperatures. I don't know, we'll just have to see. But anyway, the block right here, it's a pump block combo. What would you expect from an AIO? 
and it's very, very basic. Now it's all acrylic on the top right here. It has a glowing EVGA logo that is RGB that has some pretty nifty modes, if you will. It can flash, it can breathe. It can be CPU temperature indicator. It is a full spectrum RGB, so you can customize the color. You're not just stuck with like the basic seven. Uh, but yeah, so the software though, it's still very beta. It's running behind me right now, but I'm not even gonna show it because it's not even fair to show that because it's still not in its full form yet. It hasn't gone Super Saiyan or taken on its final form. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit later on when it's more matured. Unfortunately, it wasn't ready in time for this video. So all I had was screenshots to go by on what it will look like when it's done, but it looks a lot like Precision does for your graphics card. If you have an EVGA graphics card or any NVIDIA graphics card, it looks a lot like Precision. Now, the neat thing is because this is RGB, you are going to be able to sync your cooler with your graphics card if you have an RGB equipped EVGA graphics card so that they are in sync and not doing two different things and looking like a disco puke of RGB rave going on inside your computer. If you want that, you can do it. More power to you, I won't judge. Now when it comes to powering this thing, EVGA has kept it simple. We've got a single three pin, what looks like a fan plug on here that powers the pump, the LEDs, and the fan. And we'll talk about that in a second. And fans in the case of multi-fan units. But you need to make sure that you have a header that you're plugging this into on your motherboard that's capable of at least a one, or at most a one amp draw. Uh, most CPU and CPU optional headers on your motherboard are gonna be PWM. So they're gonna be able to handle this level of power draw. That should be fine. Just start to definitely check your manual though if you wanna plug it into something like a system fan header or a optional fan header or a chassis fan header. Sometimes those don't have as much of a power draw capability as the CPU fan headers do. So I would plug this into CPU if you can, otherwise consult your manual if you wanna plug it in somewhere else. Now coming off the pump here, you have a PWM fan splitter. Now the CPU cooler is gonna kind of control these fans, but you could plug these also into your motherboard directly or a fan controller if you wanted to say, screw the software altogether. You have that flexibility. It's not some sort of a proprietary plug, but because there's also optional software to control this as a system, if you want it to, it means there's a mini USB plug on the side of the pump. Now that means it terminates into a USB 2.0 motherboard header plug on one end. If you don't have enough headers on your motherboard, you could actually replace this with a standard mini USB cable from a charger like a GoPro or something and plug it into to the back of your motherboard by routing it through like a grommet hole or something, uh, and you can control it that way. Might not be as tidy, but there's at least options. Okay, so that's a lot of talking and a lot of glamour shots, but what about performance? We all know it's uh, how you do in the long run that really matters. Well, I've been stress testing all day. After getting around some temperature reading bugs, which I found out was a problem with hardware monitor, we'll talk about that in a separate video because it's a very important topic to talk about. Uh, using ADA64 to monitor temperatures, on the stress test stressing CPU, FPU, and cache, which is literally a torture test, not just a stability test, but it's a torture test, pumping as much heat as it possibly can into the system. I put 1.35 volts on here just to see what would happen. And we saw a package temp of 79C, yeah, it's warm, we'll talk about that in a second, 79C, and core temps ranging anywhere from 65 to about 75C on the cores. Now, yeah, that's a lot. And so is 1.35 volts. I wouldn't actually recommend running that on an AIO 24 seven. Uh, I wanted to see what the worst case scenario was gonna be. So now that I know what that stupid voltage on a high overclock was gonna get me in temperatures that were still below TJ Maxx on, that's not just a department store guys, it's actually what they call the maximum temperature allowed on a CPU before throttling starts to happen. Anyway, yeah, it's not just a place where you buy shoes. It's also takes care of your CPU. We saw that we were under that. So now I went, okay, what happens when you put in a voltage that's more appropriate for everyday 24 seven driving of this overclock? We'll still maintain 4.3 at 1.25 volts, completely stable. Uh, doing the same ADA64 test, we saw a mac a mackage, we saw a max package temperature of 65C. It came down 14C just by bringing the voltage down a little bit. And we saw core temps averaging in the mid to upper 50s. Perfect that I would run that all day long and be completely comfortable with this cooler. Again, that's at the stock fan curve. You can manually adjust the fan curve and get it even cooler at the sacrifice of sound. But again, I was testing it with as it ships. Now, what about games though? Games obviously are not as stressful as a stress. Now, what about games though? Games are obviously not as stressful as a torture test like Ada 64. So I loaded up GTA 5 put all of the draw distance and everything max. I want to draw the world out as far as we could do because that's going to put more stress on the CPU as well. Uh, it is a very CPU centric game, lots of stuff to load. And yeah, temperatures guys, well in check. High 40s on the package 
and the cores were sitting in the mid to upper 40s, and then some of the higher cores hitting as high as the low 50s. So that's, that, that's awesome. Now putting this thing all the way down to stock settings though, I saw max temperature package of 44C, and then the cores were actually staying in the upper 30s to low 40s. Definitely well within check. Now, not only does it support all of the current sockets, both on AMD and Intel, uh, both brackets are included. They are gonna be providing a free AM4 upgrade kit with the bracket that's needed for that uh, once Ryzen actually launches. So if you get one of these and you upgrade to Ryzen later, uh, you will get one of those brackets for free upon request, you just have to contact them. So anyway, there you go, guys. I think EVGA's first attempt at an AIO is actually pretty good, but they didn't have to do a whole lot. They've worked with Asa Tech in the past on the hybrid coolers. They just had to come up with their block design, some of the software and implement it. And I think they actually did a pretty good job. AIOs are what they are. I mean, they are a good way to get your foot wet, no pun intended, with water cooling. Uh, and then if you feel like using this as a gateway drug to the, you know, bigger and badder full custom loops, uh, you can do that. And don't forget, they also have what they showed off at CES, their quick release design where you can actually add radiators and add graphics cards and stuff. We will be taking a look, taking a look at that in the future when it becomes available. It's not available yet, but when it's available, you know they're going to send it to me. I'm such a water cooling whore, it's not even funny. So thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed today's video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you guys want to also help out the channel, there will be a link to this product once available on Amazon down in the description of this video. If it's not available at the time of making this video, I'll go back and add, add it later, but it helps the channel more than you'll ever know by using those affiliate links. So if you wanna use it, do it. If not, no problem, that's okay too, but uh, it's time to go. Yeah, it's. I've gotta edit this video. It's late, oh boy. That's okay. I like making videos. All right, guys. See you in the next one.